All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us, joining with us today um, for Sunday school. Uh, this class is going to be interesting because uh, it could go. We have six chapters. Um, these six chapters could go really fast, and th then uh, I'm prepared to teach on the seventh chapter uh, if it does, uh, or uh, we could uh, be on the six chapters the whole time. So it really uh, depends on how the conversation goes. The six chapters, as you probably are aware of, are mostly covering ordinances. Um, in the Restoration Edition of the, the Book of Mormon, it covers, oh, about a one and three-fourths page. So uh, we'll see how it goes. And uh, if we go quickly, uh, we'll just roll right into Chapter 7. If we don't, we'll kick Chapter 7 until next week. So um, uh, I'm quite flexible. And, and God, the, it'll probably be mostly dependent on um, your feedback. So I'll open up comments. Uh, let's turn this into a discussion. But uh, let's begin. Uh, I find I find this uh, the beginning of uh, this Mor Moroni's book fairly a little humorous, to be honest. Because um, and we'll we'll read uh, we'll read it. But essentially, Moroni says, "Yeah, so I thought I was gonna die, um, but uh, not dead yet. Not dead yet." Um, and uh, I'm going to go out a couple things uh, that might be valuable to this record. Um, uh, so let's start. And now I, Moroni, and now I, Moroni, after having made an end of abridging the account of the people of Jared, I had supposed not to have written more. But I have not yet at, I have not as yet perished. Not dead yet. Um, and I have, I, and I make not myself known to the Lamanites, lest they destroy me. For behold, their wars are exceedingly fierce among themselves. And because of their hatred, they do put to death every Nephite that will not deny the Christ. Um, I find this interesting uh, and quite unfortunate. You know, I, we just don't have the history. We don't have the records of all the situations that this could be true. Um, I, it, God, there has to be more people out there that are like the Nephites that we have this genocide and uh, they're just wiping people out. And it, this isn't the first time this has happened. Um, we have... The Lamanites, when the people of uh, anti-Nephi-Lehi converted, um, and they just wanted to get rid of that. Um, we have in the beginning of the Book of Third Nephi that uh, they're planning to do something like this if the sign of Christ's birth is not uh, um, given. Uh, but... Uh, I would assume, I would anticipate that when the history of the world is uh, shown to us, that there are most likely more people out there like the Nephites that, uh, that this happens, this has happened to. And I, Moroni, will not deny the Christ, wherefore I wander whithersoever I can for the safety of my own life, Wherefore, I write a few, th a few more things contrary to that which I had supposed. For I had supposed to not have written more. But I write a few more things that perhaps they may be wor of worth unto my brethren the Lamanites in some future day according to the will of the Lord. So it's interesting. You have here Moroni. Yeah, I, I thought I was going to die. Um not not there yet. Uh, so I'm going to add a couple more things. And you think about the way the Lord works. It seems fairly transparent to me 
that uh, the Lord, it wasn't Moroni, but the Lord wasn't done. The Lord wanted more to be written about um, within the Book of Mormon. And uh, these pieces of information that Moroni is going to impart over these last few chapters were necessary for the book to be completed. And without these things that Moroni added, I mean, Moroni could have, um, Moroni could have uh, uh, been slaughtered with his, his dad and uh, the other captains of, of 10,000. But uh, the Lord wasn't done yet with the book. It needed, it needed a couple more things. Um, there's a chat um, by Doug. It's amazing to think that without Moroni's aside, we wouldn't have the genius of Moroni 7 and 10. I was thinking the exact same thing. Like, and, and Gaul, think about trying to do, well, we do have the um, sacrament in the uh, the doctrine and covenants um, or the teachings and the commandments. Um, it is there. So M Joseph Smith could have, could have put it in there. Um, but, you know, you think about it. So the, the, the um, first covenant that was made um, it would have been in 1833, 1834, that was based off the Book of Commandments. And that had the, do the, the, the sacrament in there. Just as a, 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 a thought, if we didn't have the sacrament in the Book of Mormon, and now we're under covenant in the Book of Mormon, would there have been an issue with that? Like... Do we need the sacrament prayers in the Book of Mormon as well uh, to affect the covenant of the Book of Mormon? I don't know. Any thoughts on that? I I like this is Doug. I like that thought, and I also like the idea that the words of the baptismal prayer were changed in the 1835 DNC, and so now we have the original, thanks to these chapters. Yeah. Well, I guess yeah. I'm sorry. That I guess it's in third Nephi. Yeah, it's too. like a um, it's like the Lord knew that the Book of Mormon needed to be the covenant, and they added the necessary pieces of the doctrine of Christ into the Book of Mormon to be explicit that this was how it was supposed to be, so that you could wrap this covenant around the Book of Mormon and have everything that that you needed in the covenant. Anyway, let's continue on. And again, if you have a thought, uh, uh, let jump in. Well, let's jump into uh, chapter one or chapter two, um, uh, because these chapters are so small. I'm just gonna read them and let's stop and let's talk about them. The words of Christ, which he spake unto his disciples, the twelve, whom he had chosen, as he laid his hands on them. So this is interesting. Um, we don't have this in third Nephi. Um, I, but the Lord feels that this is important for us to know now. So um, uh, kind of interesting. And he called them by name saying, ye shall call on the father in my name in mighty prayer. And after that ye have done this, ye shall have power that on him whom ye shall lay your hands, ye shall give the Holy Ghost. And in my name, excuse me, in my name shall ye give it, for thus do mine apostles. Now Christ spake these words unto them at the time of his first appearing, and the multitude heard it not, but the disciples heard it, and on as many as they laid their hands fell the Holy Ghost. Um, okay, so there was a couple things in here that uh, highlighted to me where it uh, hadn't highlighted to me before. One is um, the mighty prayer. Um, and you shall call on the Father, Father, in my name, in mighty prayer. 
Now we get ordained uh, or in, you know, in the LDS tradition, you get ordained a, a priest uh, to baptize. You get ordained an elder to uh, give the, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you get it from somebody and their, their priesthood lineage goes back to Peter, James, and John, which then goes back to Christ. Or not, excuse me, not Peter, James. It goes through uh, uh, the three witnesses and then it goes through the other. Anyway, um, right here you have the Son of God, who of course is, as uh, Denver has said, when you have Christ, you have the power of heaven. So Christ isn't even the powers of heaven. When you have Christ, you have the power of heaven with you. Um, so you have the power of heaven here that is saying to his disciples, okay, here you go. Um, I laid my hands on you, but you now need to do something. You need to, uh, in mighty prayer, ask to receive this. Isn't that so much different than what you, you know, you were raised or what you were taught growing up? Um, you know, if we were taught growing up that when you give, you know, when you're blessed with the Holy Ghost, it's actually the words are receive the Holy Ghost and you need to go out and you need to supplicate to God and you need to, you need to uh, um, ask him, you know, in mighty prayer for this blessing. And when you're ordained to this priesthood, you need to ask in mighty prayer that you'll be filled with the power of God. Um, God, things would be so much different. But um, why why do you guys think that uh, why do you think that uh, Moroni is telling us this at this time and? Um, and he's telling it to everybody. It's not, he's not just telling it to an exclusive set of disciples. Why, why is this, uh, here in the book of Mormon? Any thoughts? Uh, this is Doug. I was actually just thinking about this as you were talking and I really hadn't thought about it much before, but in the context of the remnant movement, um, we pretty much presume that the Holy Ghost will fall on people as a matter of course, and I put this in a chat, uh, after the baptism of water, you'll be given the Holy Ghost, but I look around and I don't see this power given around, in our day, I don't see this being distributed by the Lord, I think it was in Joseph's day, with the 12, but I don't think this is actually happening in actuality in the LDS church in present day, because as you say, it's simply an invitation. I think what was happening in Christ's day as they were praying in mighty prayer in faith because yeah no kidding you know they got the Holy Ghost and because the people that they bestowed it to were ready for that and it was maybe a, a boost but if the Book of Mormon is a pattern for our day and for the remnant movement perhaps in particular how do you see this is it something maybe yet to be realized That's a great question. Um, any thoughts on that? I, I <laughs> great question. Let's punt. Uh, any any thoughts on that, you guys? Um, I missed that question because I got disconnected. Can you restate the question? So my my question is, if the Book of Mormon is a covenant and arguably a pattern for our day. We, we in the remnant movement have largely taken the view that the Holy Ghost will fall on people. That is a gift of the Holy Ghost. As a matter of course, sometime between you and God after baptism. Because um, I, I think this power was given to Joseph in his day through his covenant. And they had that real power to no kidding, give the gift of the Holy Ghost for the apostles. I, I don't think that really exists in the LDH church today. It's largely an invitation. So is this perhaps implying that it, it is part of our covenant and part of our pattern that we will one day have people that will give this 
as maybe a booster, like I think of the temple when it's established will be a boost for us to see the face of Christ. Is it kind of some analogous process that sometime we'll have this within the remnant movement? Let me give you my thoughts um, just real quick. And then anybody else can, you know, tell tell me I'm wrong or, or give a different thought, but uh in in Denver's ten lectures, those lectures are um, they are uh, well, just like the book Preserving the Restoration, where he took the ten lectures and made chapters into them. They're essentially sequential; they're linear. So you start off with hope, then you go to faith, then you go to repentance, and then you go into a covenant. Now, part of our repentance process was reclaiming the scriptures um, and removing removing our con- Oh, so what does it mean to call on the Father in my name, in my prayer? You know, what is that? Sorry. Oh, uh, Johnny, go for it. I. I- Sorry, I didn't know I was unmuted. I was talking to my daughter. Sorry, Bryce, I did not mean to interrupt you. I'm so no, sorry. you're fine. You're fine. Let me finish what I was saying, and then I, we'd love to hear what yeah, you have. Go to- ahead. I did not know I was unmuted, so I had no intention to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I'll, I'll finish what I'm saying, and then you jump in. Yes, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So you go into repentance, and then from repentance, you give it a, get a covenant. But the next thing is priesthood. Um, and you know, the, the doctrine of Christ is this process of, uh, repentance, cleansing, sanctification. Um, I, but, I that priesthood comes from it through the sanctification process. I, um, opens up the doorway for the powers of heaven to minister to you. And it is in the ministration of the powers of heaven that you receive, this power but uh those are just some thoughts what, what do you what are you thinking uh johnny sorry about that i yes. was just comparing the words it, the uh, one idea so i guess i would and this is maybe rhetorical doug i think it was doug who asked the question um i are you not experiencing these gifts um, already, like you ask it as if the remnant or somebody is going to experience this in a future day. Um, are you not experiencing it now? I mean, have you not been experiencing it um, since you were baptized, since you've been rebaptized again since that um, time? Like, if you if you compare this chapter or this verse in Moroni in sort of a chiastic way back to second Nephi 13 in in uh, paragraph two he's using the almost exact same language in Moroni he says ye shall call on the father in my name in second Nephi 13 he says he that is baptized in my name to him the father will give the holy ghost we have the same being the father we have the same reference to petitioning God in Christ's name and we have the same gift being given namely the Holy Ghost so when I see these kinds of similarities I don't think it's an accident right because it's it's the name of Christ and you're getting a gift from the Father the gift being the Holy Ghost so when you um when you compare these two things together, to me, there's there's a little more depth there, um, maybe pointing to how do I get more Holy Ghost, and is more Holy Ghost currently being poured out upon those who will call on God in mighty prayer um, to receive the name of Christ? This is lower down. He says, they, they are witness unto the Father, that's the prayer, that you're willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism. So the mechanism to get more Holy Ghost 
is to call on the name of Christ or to take upon you the name of Christ by calling upon the Father in prayer through the mechanism of baptism. This, this chapter 2 of Moroni is not separate from the doctrine of Christ. It's, he's actually expounding faith, repentance, baptism for a greater abundance of the Holy Spirit by taking upon you the name of Christ repetitively. In other words, I've taken Christ's name on me at eight years old, but um, can I take upon his name upon me again and in, and in so doing invoke a greater abundance of the Holy Spirit? Um, that's happening. That's happening right now. That's happening among um, people in this movement and maybe outside this movement. Um, so, uh, and, and the gifts are that you uh, speak with the tongue of angels. So are we speaking with the tongues of angels? Do you understand the language of the angels? Do the angels speak to you and can you understand what they're saying because you speak in their tongue or their language? Um, their language being an unconfounded understanding of the Book of Mormon and the, and the doctrines taught there, um, having them being unconfounded or having that language taught to you through the Spirit upon obeying the commandment to repent and be baptized and be taught that language by the angels themselves. So I, I would say, yes, that language, that is happening. Um, absolutely. The question I guess then I'd ask back is, can you say so? Can you declare, do you know, and can, have you felt the song of redeeming love in you? And if you felt it at one time and don't at this point, what is it that we would uh, need to engage in to bring that spirit back upon us again? So. Yeah, um, I I agree with everything you're saying, and and certainly that's a, a valid process, and I think that's how it works. Is doctrine of Christ is just a mechanism that is an umbrella mechanism for how we come to see the face of Christ, and that includes reception of the Holy Ghost. The scriptures are laid open to our view. We have a greater understanding of the scriptures. I, I agree with all that, and I think I, I like a blog post, a series of blog posts. Uh, Denver did, and they're in his brown books, um, Remembering the Covenants, I think it is. He has a series about the gift of the Holy Ghost, and it talks about, the, or I'm sorry, baptism of fire of the Holy Ghost, and it says, well, it's kind of a, a series of events that culminates in sanctification and seeing the face of Christ, and you can go through those events in different order, and it, but it will eventually culminate in in this happening. And I, I've gone through a, a subset of those events. I haven't gone through all, all of them. Um, but yeah, I would agree that I've I've experienced a mighty change of heart and I have the, the spirit to a greater degree than I would have years ago. But I don't think that happened when I was eight years old. I mean, when I was eight, someone didn't lay their hands on me and then um, I had at that time immediately all the gifts of the spirit that I do now. And I guess I look as I look at this first, I kind of it, you know, if I take it to face value, sorry. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, sorry. If I take it to face value, I'm I'm saying, okay, well, when these disciples they did this, it no kidding happened to people then. Uh, and maybe maybe it happened. Later, I don't know, but it sounds like it kind of happened when they laid their hands on him. And I guess that kind of suggests to me some kind of spiritual power that maybe I don't see in the LDS church. It's, but, but you're right. Absolutely. It can happen as we make the ordinance real in our lives <laughs> through, you know, like uh, 35, <laughs> what, 11 or nine where it says you know two blameless had faith and repentance and so they had the baptism of the ghost absolutely that happens so i i don't know if that's any clearer but kind of what i'm wondering about 
Hey, Doug, can I suggest um, an idea that took me a long time to understand that might be helpful? Sure, go ahead. I used to read the scriptures and assume that kind of like you suggested that someone laid their hands on this person and they are immediately filled with the Holy Ghost um, to this incredible degree, sort of in an instant. And um, the way that Denver goes about describing it is a little bit um, lawyer-like. <laughs> So he says things like, um, you know, it's not pixie dust. It's not fairy dust. Uh, he says things like, it doesn't happen in a moment. Uh, he talks about that the scripture that defines or describes Nephi's process is in like one or two sentences, but that it would have taken years or even maybe a decade or more. But he's sort of, you know, wrapping it up or, or, uh, you know, talking about it in a very short way. And so there's a law that underpins the receipt of the Holy Ghost specifically, but in, in general, it underpins the entirety of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the law is grace for grace. And so I think or what I've come to understand, it's not its not a think anymore. I, I believe it. I know it, in a sense, to be true because of my experience that the Holy Ghost comes grace for grace. And the, that is the law upon which all blessings are predicated. And for Christ to simply dump the Holy Ghost upon a, a recipient who is unprepared as far as their knowledge goes, their, maybe their life experience, maybe their understanding or wisdom in the gospel, maybe their um, understanding or depth of understanding of scriptures, for God to, to sort of just put the Holy Ghost in its entirety upon any individual in that state would actually abrogate not only law, the law of grace for grace, it would destroy agency it would bring us back into the presence of the father and yet we would still be um sinful or or unclean as to our capacity to obey the law does that make sense so i don't view that in um this verse in moroni 2 that it simply came upon them out of the blue and um that it was some so powerful gift that was beyond our current ability or understanding. Rather, I believe it's exactly like it's happening to us. Your experiences are exactly like what Moroni is describing. Mine are exactly like Moroni is describing. We're the same, right? I'm not getting something different from you. Rather, it's just a different way to look at it to say, I'm simply going to accept that the law is grace for grace and agency. And whenever I start to think um, that God would just pour out more than he is going to pour out, I'm actually um, ascribing to a form of a more satanic idea that, that God will just simply give it to me in an instant, uh, sort of like magic fairy dust. And what God wants to do is he wants to say, look, what if I gave you the very next principle that you lack and that only, and then I see how you operate in it. And then we go from there. Right. And then you repent again and get baptized and we'll see, I'll, I'll give you another one and we'll see how that goes. Right. And it's a series of tests, like in Alma 32, where the seed is planted, then it's allowed to grow. Then it sees if it, it expands or dies. And then you you retain the, the the idea or you cast it aside, and that in this process you gain more and more Holy Ghost or more fellowship through the veil with the powers of heaven. But anyways, I'm going on. I don't mean to. So that was I, that's a long way to sort of describe um, that that this isn't different from us. This is us. This isn't descriptive of some other fantastic event that we're waiting to happen. It's actually happening. 
we just have to recognize the gift God's willing to give. And the gift he's willing to give us is grace for grace without uh, abrogating our agency. And that takes a long time and is, is why the repetitiveness of the doctrine of Christ is present. Um, yeah, I, um, I would like to say something. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay, because I'm outside. So I agree with all of that. I think we all are looking for the event that we feel the baptism of fire. And yet we wouldn't be here in this movement if we didn't have a measure of truth being open to our eyes, if we weren't seeking and receiving um, validation of this truth. Um, I think because, for example, Denver, when he was baptized, it seems like he received that Holy Ghost immediately because he proceeded to uh, give some revelation out and he, he seemed to have a gift, maybe because of what he had done in previous existences or whatever. I mean, apparently he's a special man. And so I think um, recently he wrote a message that says, uh, if you're participating in, I would say, this movement, then you are on the path. And so I think we have to gain um, solitude and confirmation that we will receive that gift when it is time for us, when the Lord determines to bestow it on us. Other than that, we're in the path, and I think that's comforting. Perfect. Yeah, so... so um... This is Doug again. I, I don't, I, uh, I totally agree that the Lord works with us individually. Our paths may be different. Um, I agree that this verse does not say immediately, so we can't make the assumption that it was, there's no time delay. Um, however, I think in the individualness of what we could all go through, um, I think typically for a lot of us, it, uh, it goes back to the idea of is the baptism of the fire Holy Ghost a process or an event? And, you know, so I, I think the Lord is particularly his symbolism. He, he uses his symbolism for a reason. Uh, so he describes what the gospel is in three places. It's faith, repentance, baptism of fire, um, baptism of water rather than baptism of fire. DNC 33, LDS, DNC 33. 9 LDS and then 13 by 27. So when he says it's a baptism of fire, I, you know, I, I hear people, particularly in the LDS church, saying, well, it's a 70 year process. And I think, well, that sounds a lot like sprinkling to me. I, I think our hearts can be prepared. We can come up to a place where we're prepared to receive something. But I think ultimately there are milestones that happen, events that happen when we're ready for them. I, I, I do not think. I, I would take a different position that it does not abrogate our agency to receive some of that in one swoop. I mean, because clearly that happened with Lamoni and the king of the Lamanites. They were totally killing people, and then they were basically laid down for three days, and they had their experience. And so individually, can it happen in a lot of that in one experience? I, I think so. But I, I think for most of us, uh, I, I agree that odds are that it takes a lot of preparation for us to come to the point where we're ready to receive all of it. So. All right. Perfect. So this is a great Ryan? discussion. Let's, uh, can we, can we go to the next chapter? I, um, this is all really fantastic, but, uh, uh there's, there's one interesting let's do thing one more comment and let's keep on going. Okay. Uh, Leonard, did you have a question or a comment? There was one more. Yeah, I wanted to just say that uh, just looking at the chapter, looking at the verse, um, when I was baptized, someone laid my laid their hands on me. <laughs> Meaning they took me in their hands, okay? So there's something there. He's, he's not really describing an ordinance in a sense. He's just saying, hey, People are going to, you're going to put, lay your hands on these people and they're going to get the Holy Ghost. So, in my particular experience, when I was rebaptized, I was in this man's hands 
he, he took me down into the water and drew me back out. And I truly was, um, um, I had this, um, overflow of, uh, the Holy ghost come into me. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's what he's trying to tell us here is this, that these men were, were given, uh, uh, uh the, these, this direction by the Lord to go to mighty prayer and, and receive this power. And, and now we have men who need to do that when, when they're going to perform this ordinance. And when they do lay their hands on people, the Holy ghost, the Holy ghost comes and it, and it came to me. So that's, that's all I wanted to share was that we're seeing this happen. It happened in my life. Uh, it burned, uh, iniquity out of me um when it happened so um i think uh you know i think we're seeing a, a fulfillment of this uh in our time right now perfect so these are all fantastic the the one thought uh uh <laughs> the one thought that uh I have before we just continue on is the beauty of the gospels is, is that it's anecdotal and that it's tailored to the individual. Um, so the, the only thought that I would have is I would guess that all of us are right from the positions that we're coming from because God tailors the, the experiences that we have with him and his Holy spirit uh, to reflect the condition and stage and uh, how he wants us to communicate with him. So I, I would, I would make, make the, the thought that we're probably all coming from a position that what we're saying is, is true. Um, okay. So I want to continue on because we do have a few more uh, things that we want to talk about. Um, I'm going to read chapter three because it's just one paragraph. Um, the manner which the disciples, which were called the elders of the church, ordained priests and teachers, after they had prayed unto the Father in the name of Christ, they laid their hands on them and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, I ordain you to be a priest. Or, if he be a teacher, I ordain you to be a teacher. To preach repentance and remission of sins through Jesus Christ by the endurance of faith on his name to the end. Amen. And after this manner did they ordain priests and teachers according to the gifts and callings of God unto men. And they ordained them by the power of the Holy Ghost, which was in them. So, you know, looking at this, this is a little foreign to what we're doing with this movement. Um, because we're trying something that has only been accomplished two other times. Um, what applicability or how do you see this in our current condition? Um, do you see this as directly applicable to us today? Is it needed today? Um, if it's in the Book of Mormon, is it is it required of us to do these type of things? What are your thoughts, you guys? One of the things that's interesting here Bryce, is this last chapter and this chapter have uh, a common thread, and it's the words, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the last chapter, and going back to 3 Nephi chapter 11, um, there's almost an implication that Christ is commanding them to use his name. Um, in an organization that I attended earlier today, uh, there were claims that were made of by everybody in that organization that they had received uh, and taken upon them the name of Christ. I should have put that the other way, that they had taken upon them and received the name of Christ. Um, I didn't challenge them, but my guess is there was no instance where anybody ever had Christ come and say, I now authorize you, you know, I have adopted you into my family and i authorize you to use my name which is kind of what i see in third nephi in chapter two and maybe even here 
is those who are actually have been part of become part of the family of Christ are given the authority to use his name and others kind of uh, think they have it, but perhaps they're usurping it. And so in that sense, uh, w the question you're asking here, of, you know, do we do this? Uh, well, maybe it's appropriate that we not do this because uh, maybe that would imply that we were also usurping or that we had uh, actually had been visited by him. I think that's good. I mean, we know that uh, in the last days, the angels do the reaping. Um, so if you are called to some sort of position or or probably not position is the right word, if you are called to be a teacher or you are called to be a priest, um, I, similar to Jacob and Joseph, Nephi calling Jacob and Joseph. Um, but uh, if you're called to be a priest or if you're called to be a teacher, that that calling should be originating from the other side of the veil. Um, any other thoughts on this before we move to the next section? Okay. All right. Chapter four. We're going to get into the sacrament. Um. I'm just going to go ahead and read this again because it, it's short. And the manner of their elders and priests uh, administering the flesh and blood of Christ unto the church. I just want to point out something. We just in chapter 3 talked about teachers and priests. A priest denoting someone who is responsible for ordinances and a teacher responsible for teaching. Now we're going into the sacrament, and it, um, interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, uh, doesn't include teachers, uh, but it goes elders and priests. Um, I don't know. Perhaps there's something there in that uh, when you're called to some sort of assignment, that that assignment is specific to what the Lord has asked you to do. Um, just a, just a thought. And the manner of their elders and priests administering the flesh and blood of Christ unto the church. And they administered it according to the commandments of Christ. Wherefore, we know that the manner to be true. And the elder or priest did minister it. And they did kneel down with the church and pray to the Father in the name of Christ, saying, O God, the eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and win us unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he has given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. What's interesting to me about this is that Growing up in the LDS church, you know, when you hit 16 and you become a priest, you know, the goal, one of the goals is to memorize this prayer. But I think that it's much more appropriate to understand the um, topics or categories of things that are in this prayer. You're supposed to take bread, or you're supposed to take your on the name of Christ, take the bread so it sanctifies you. You take the sanctification, um, or the, the bread is sanctified. You then take upon yourself the name of Christ so that you keep remember him and keep his commandments and have his spirit. Um but but perhaps looking at this prayer in categories of things that you should be doing or topics instead of this rote resuscitation of this standard prayer over and over again would be uh, more beneficial. What what do you guys think about uh, any thoughts on this? Do you have two hours? <laughs> Nope, <laughs> but uh, we have probably about 15 minutes. 
not specifically on this alone. Herein lies, I think, so many things that we've been taught and we continue to carry with us, but it's very, very difficult for us to challenge ourselves um, and, as you say, really understand what is in here. Um, three quick examples. Um, here we are. First of all, uh, this is a prayer to sanctify the bread. Uh, this is not a covenant, right? Uh, the covenants that are made as part of partaking of the sacrament have to occur outside of this prayer. This prayer is not even covenant language, right? It, it, it's really interesting because people talk. Well, okay, uh, I'll leave that. We don't have much time. Like I said, two hours. Um, another aspect of it that's very, very interesting is uh, what isn't said here. Um, there's no implication here that you partake of the sacrament in order to repent. Uh, if anything, there's the, the implication that in order to be worthy to partake of the sacrament, you have already repented and been forgiven and therefore are qualified to make a covenant. Point number three, um, and this just goes, you know, one of many examples within the prayer itself. Um, and I'm sorry, I guess I'm kind of challenging you a little bit, Bryce, because you just did what almost all LDS do, which is to say, oh, in this prayer, I am taking upon myself the name of Christ. Well, maybe, but the prayer specifically says a willingness to. It doesn't necessarily mean that you get to make that choice. In other words, you get to tell Christ, perhaps, I am willing to be your son, your daughter, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Christ is going to say to you, I adopt you. Um, so the willingness to become of Christ is not the same as being of Christ. And, and there are just so many layers on top of these few words of things that we have been taught since we were babies uh, that have made it into our minds. And a lot of that stuff isn't here. Um, what the words actually say in many cases are in direct conflict with that which we've been brought up to believe. Okay, perfect, perfect. I want to think of, uh, um, oh, I, wait, go Johnny. Bryce, can I ask a question? Well, no, I just have a question. Why do you say it's not covenantal language? I'm, that uh, seems... Are you saying that baptism is the covenant or like is there is there no covenant here that we're doing? Is that your assertion? I would assert, I believe that if I were partaking this bread that has been blessed and I were saying within my mind something like, Oh God, the eternal father, I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ and covenant with you that I am willing to remember your son and the sacrifice of your son. And I am willing to witness to you, God, the eternal father, that I am willing to take upon him that name. And I will always remember him and I will keep his commandments. And I do this that I might always have his spirit to be with me and to shine from me, etc. That to me would be language that sounded more like a covenant. What else is a witness but a covenant? Uh, I don't know if you're, my daughter asked what else is a witness but a covenant? I'm not challenging you, by the way. I hope there's no contention here. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly interested to learn your, your view. Can you talk about um, it? Yeah, I, I think we're out of time now. I, I would love to chat about it. I don't know how we do it in the short side because there's so much. Well, if anybody needs to go, could the forum just be left open? Or are we going to close? No, we still have time, you guys. But uh, um, I have a thought. Do you mind if I interject with with something that may, something that's on my mind that may help or be a new something to throw into the discussion? 
If is that all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I want to throw in uh, essentially two different things because we're talking about we're talking about the sacrament, and what's fascinating about the sacrament is that when Christ came to the Americas, um, the sacrament happens uh, frequent, like more frequent than you would anticipate. Um, but there's essentially two types of sacrament, though, in in Third Nephi. The first sacrament is he goes and he talks to his 12 disciples, which we're actually kind of getting little inserts here in Moroni about those 12 disciples. And he says, hey, go get bread and wine, and we're going to do the sacrament, or I'm going to show you a new ordinance. Because we know that uh, we know that uh, um, the bread and wine is uh, essentially a replacement for the uh, – hey, Johnny, I'm going to – can you mute yourself just for – okay, perfect. Um, it's essentially a replacement for the um, – sacrifice of the lamb it's 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 the it's what happens next so this first one is symbolic it's bread and wine that is sanctified then we have another sacrament that is produced miraculously so in um just one second in third nephi nine of the the restoration edition you have this, you have, and it came to pass that he commanded the multitude that they should should cease to pray and also his disciples. And co he commanded that they should not cease to pray in their hearts. And he commanded them that they should arise and stand upon their feet. And they arose and stood upon their feet. And it came to pass that he broke bread again and blessed it and gave it to his disciples to eat. And when he had eaten, he commanded that they should break bread and give unto the multitude. And when they had given unto the multitude, he also gave them wine to drink and commanded them that they should give unto the multitude. Now there had been no bread, neither wine brought by the disciples, neither by the multitude, but he truly gave unto them bread to eat and also wine to drink. And he said unto them, he that eateth this bread eateth my body to their soul. And he that drinketh this wine drinketh of my blood to their soul. And their soul shall never hunger nor thirst, but shall be filled. And now when the multitude had all eaten and drank, behold, they were filled with the Spirit. And they did cry out with one voice and gave glory to Jesus, whom they both saw and heard. So you have this first instance where, um, uh, well, the first time the disciples go and give the bread, go and get the bread. And the disciples get the wine and it's, you know, normal, you know, somebody made the bread, somebody uh, harvest the wheat and made the bread and somebody uh, uh, made the wine. But the second time it's all miraculous. Uh, it's all from Christ. Now you can think of it. Well, he just, you know, he did. That's what he did. He, he, you know, that's, that's the magic behind it. Um, or, um, you can think of it as potentially a progression and the testimony of John supports that progression. Um, but on the, this is chapter 12 of the testimony of John, but at the horizon of the morning star, Jesus stood at the sacred entry. However, the disciples could not recognize it was Jesus for the glory about him. Then Jesus asked them, children, have, have you celebrated the ritual meal? They answered him, no. And he directed them and said, approach the veil to the east and you will find what you seek. They approached the veil as instructed. And now they were overcome by the multitude of what was received. Therefore, the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he quickly clothed himself for he was not wearing the apparel and cast himself into the great deep. And the other disciples came into the ark and parted also the veil, for they were not bound by the limits of this world. And they ascended, and they saw a burning fire at the offering place, and a flesh offering was upon it. Who is also the bread of life? 
Jesus said to them, rise above the flesh you now occupy. And Simon Peter ascended and drew the veil open. And there were ministering a hundred and, and then fifty and then three for those who may come, or those many who they beheld, yet the veil remained open. And Jesus said to them, come and eat the food of the rising sun. And none of the disciples asked of him, now what name is now yours? Now, what it, knowing that it was their Lord, Jesus then served to them his flesh and blood, and they were filled with the Spirit. This was now the third time Jesus ministered to his disciples following his rise from among the dead. I'm going to make a suggestion that um, there is a progression between sacrament and what eventually will be given that progression is like um any progression but the the goal of the the whole sacrament is to reflect that image to gain that sanctification so that the the thing that should be happening will happen in the future um but i wanted i wanted to highlight that just because you know, we do think in the LDS tradition or coming from the LDS tradition that this is, this is something, but um, it's something a lot more than that. Um, anyway, I, I wanted to throw that in because I think that that can help place some thoughts into our head about what this ordinance actually is or could be or designed to lead us towards. Um, anyway, um, any thoughts on that? I do want to hit chapter five and chapter six just a little bit before we finish. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Or do you want to throw in a couple, you know, different opinions? I, I'd be more than happy to hear them. So very quickly, I mean, I think you just did a beautiful job. I mean, it seems that in all of our ordinances, um, no matter which step you happen to be or rung on the ladder, uh, they have a different context and a different set of meetings. But in, in this particular case, something I, I would hope uh, to amplify that you just said, and that has, the, it's this idea of having his spirit to be with them. Um, we're almost always, we almost always imply that having his spirit to be with us means that we receive his spirit like we receive the Holy Ghost. And yet there's a completely separate and distinct meaning from it. Not that that may not be correct, but there's another meaning, which is to say, if we have the spirit of Christ with us, then we will do the things that he does. Our countenance will be like his. Um, perhaps it will glow like Moses did. But in any case, um, if we have his spirit within us, uh, we will be like him and we will come to know him. Uh, and so, you know, that's just, I think, one example. <clears throat> Again, trying to amplify a point that you made, Bryce, to just talk to how much depth and beauty there is in these few words. Perfect. Okay, I, I let me jump to the next one. And uh, um, while this is thinking, um, there was Denver made a comment once that uh, you know if you think of and I'm going to paraphrase it and butcher it, but uh, if you think of God as fire, what uh, what can the only thing that fire do, and that is produce more fire? If we can come to a a state that um, our fire is resembling his fire, then we've come to a state of salvation. Um, but anyway, let me uh, let me do this. This uh, and the manner of ministering the wine. Behold, they took the cup and said, "O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son Jesus Christ to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it." that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy son. 
which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Um, sorry, just one more, one thought on this. Um, I made some comments a, a, a month or so two ago in a fairly public place, and um, the comment was essentially, you know, uh, in the law of Moses, they missed the mark because they didn't believe that God could come into a tabernacle of clay. Um, in the LDS tradition, you miss the mark when you adopt an ordinance, a ritual of endowment, and don't realize that it points to an actual ascension um, into the presence of God. Um, when you look at these uh, ordinances, we're talking about the law of Moses is fulfilled this is the next thing that Christ is, is communicating and wanting us to do. And there's so much ascension language in here. Sanctify, um, remembrance, witness, have spirit. I mean, th this is all ascension language. Um, like Johnny said about this continual process. Um, I mean, it's, it's just beautiful and it's fascinating. Um, any thoughts on this? I, I, sorry for going so fast, but, um, any thoughts on this? Okay. So we're sanctifying bread. We're sanctifying wine. Wine is the proper drink because it represents the bitter cup and the blood much more than water does. Um, okay. Let's, let's, uh. Finish with chapter six. And thanks for letting me uh, go fairly quickly. I did want to hit chapter six before we finish today. Um, so chapter six is just uh, two paragraphs, but there's a whole lot there. Um, so let me uh, start with the first paragraph. And now I speak concerning baptism. So we've gone from getting power, essentially, to here's some ordinances, these new ordinances, we're blessing bread, all that goes with that. We're blessing wine with all that goes with it. Now we're going into baptism. And now I speak concerning baptism. Behold, elders, priests, and teachers were baptized. Isn't this interesting? In the, I pointed out in the, the prayers or in the, the sacrament, it noticeably um, uh, excluded teachers. Now teachers are back. Um, elders, priests, and teachers were baptized. And they, and they were not baptized, save they brought forth fruit, meat that they were worthy of it. Um, neither did they receive any, any unto baptism, save they came forth with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and witness unto the church that they truly repented of all their sins. Now here's a, an interesting give and take here. Um, it has been said that when we establish a temple, that there will be a baptismal font outside of the temple. And uh, Denver has made the comment that, you know, anybody will be able to be baptized. He even made the comment, you know, President Nelson could come in and, and get baptized at this font. But he highly doubts that he would. So um, they talk about 90% or depending on the quote, 80% or 90% of life is showing up. Is the act of just showing up and having a desire to be baptized good enough to qualify for the fruit, the broken heart, and the contrite spirit? Or in the Latter-day Saint tradition, do we need to sit down and interview each other um, and determine if you're going to meet certain, you know, minimal, minimum viable uh, requirements, or is just showing up the fruit and the heart and the spirit. Any thoughts on that? I, I suspect that the people who 
get there will be the ones that are prepared and have been led there by angels, servants, if you will. Yeah. I mean, we've had, so God, the 10th lecture was in 2014. Um, so we've had almost five years uh, um, since that lecture in September 14. Um, I mean, it makes me feel like uh, uh, Hugh Nibley's comment about the mysteries of the kingdom. You know, the, the greatest uh, way to hide the mystery or the, the, uh, the mysteries are mysteries because nobody goes after it. So, you know, with this baptism, uh, ultimately it, it is available to, to most everybody, but only those who are seeking are going to actually enter into it. Um, I'm going to continue on unless there's, there's thoughts and none were received unto bapti baptism, save they took upon themselves the name of Christ having a determination to serve him unto the end. And after they had been received unto baptism and were wrought upon and cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost, they were numbered among the people of the church of Christ. And their names were taken that they may be remembered and nourished by the good word of God to keep them in the right way, to keep them continually watchful unto prayer, relying alone upon the merits of Christ, who was the author and the finisher of their faith. Anything uh, stand out here to you guys? You know, it's amazing to me that uh, my background being LDS, I associate so for much of my life the idea that baptism makes you part of an institution. But here it's pretty clear that, yeah, they're baptized. And, and, oh, by the way, after that, then their names were added to the records of the church. It's just – but I read that for years and don't think anything of it. So it's just kind of funny. Yeah. When I was, when we were, uh, my mother-in-law asked, um, uh, a while ago, there was a comp we were talking about, uh, or my wife was talking to my mother-in-law about our oldest when she turns, when she desires, you know, to get baptized, you know, how's that going to work out? You're, are you going to go into a church? How the, no, no, you get baptized unto Christ and then you go from there. Um, I think one of the big things here that I wanted to point out is that uh, it's always Christ relying alone on the merits of Christ, who was the author and finisher of our faith. So many times we rely on some structure or some important person um, or somebody that uh, has helped us along the path or something. Um, but uh if we don't rely on the merits of Christ alone on the merits of Christ, then, uh, uh, you know, we're missing the mark. That's, that's not a good thing. All right. Let me know if you have any thoughts. Let's finish with this paragraph. Oh. I'd, I'd like to just point out one thing. Yeah, go for it. If I could. Um, well, I, I guess you were going to read that next, uh, verse so maybe it would be more appropriate then but he mentions that the point of all this was that there should be no iniquity among them um in the glossary of terms the word iniquity is um expanded to mean inequity and so i i wonder what it would be like if in our fellowship we took moroni chapter six as sort of the guide and standard to govern ourselves with um, to say to one another, there will be no in inequity among us because all of us will be professed and confessed sinners. There will be no one on the shore saying, well, you know, I did, I did okay this week or, or, or I got baptized, you know, a year ago. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. Um, in this in this chapter, it begins with the equity of the elders, priests, and teachers being baptized. This isn't an accident. Obviously, to be an elder, a teacher, or a priest, they would have previously been baptized. But the way they begin their meeting, 
the way they begin their fellowship as they gather together was that the very greatest, those who would get the most praise, perhaps, those who would be patted on the back and said, damn good job up there, really appreciate it. Man, you just, you just nailed that sermon today, right? These guys, they're down in the waters showing that they have an endurance of faith continually until the end and I'm quoting Nephi there, to, to show that they're equal with and on the same standing with all the members of the congregation who gather together to worship. They don't place themselves above saying, here, come, come, come to me. I will administer in an ordinance for you, you poor, hapless fools who need salvation. But instead they say, me, I. I, I am undone. I am in need of the atoning blood of Christ. I am relying alone upon the merits of Christ. And I think that the example here, it's not overt by any means, but the example in this passage, I believe, one of them, there's so many layers, but one of them is, is, is the equity of the doctrine of Christ, the equity that repentance and baptism, and if the first people down were the teachers, priests, and elders, the equity that creates confessing your sins before the people, meaning you're in the water. Everyone at the fellowship meeting is a witness to the fact that the elders, teachers, and priests are sinners, are lost, are in need of the atoning blood of Christ. In this way, I believe, in this example, the reason why God told Moroni, hey, I know you thought you were done, but the problem that the Gentiles face in the last days to bring in Zion is, is that they want to raise up unto themselves idols and masters and benefactors and people who will preach to them and so I need you to show by example how to create equity within my church. And the way to create equity is that those who are highest will be the first to be baptized. They'll be the first to confess their sins. And when you have this happen in a fellowship, I can testify because I've been in these kinds of fellowships. There is no iniquity. There's no one that's trying to be above or greater than another. All are witnessing before God, angels, and their fellow man that they are sinners. And I think, I think there's power in that. And, and I want to add, Bryce, I appreciate your um, mention of the ascension pattern. And I, and I absolutely believe ordinances are a type or a symbol of a greater thing. But I also absolutely believe that the way we show God that we're willing to continually be diligent is through the ordinance. We don't have anything else. And um, if we'll do the ordinance, the ascension is a natural byproduct. It just happens. I don't have to pray to God to ask to be taken to the third heaven. It happens through grace for grace, submitting my will to the Father's, acting in accordance to the one commandment given to, by Nephi in the first person of the Father and the Son, each witnessing that the commandment is to repent and be baptized. Alma 12 reiterates it on the brass plates in, in Alma 12 when he says the first commandment given after the fall was to repent and be baptized. And this was the commandment that in effect overcame the effects of the fall. And if you didn't obey the second commandment to repent and be baptized continually until the end, then you brought down upon you the wrath in God's first provocation as well as the second. And so I, I pray for equity. I pray for equality. I pray that we can, in our fellowships, um, maybe take Moroni 6 and really um, live it and uh, be it. So I don't know if that's helpful to anyone, but.
that's kind of how I've seen uh, really beautiful fellowships develop uh, in equality. Well, that's great. You know, I really like those comments. Um, uh, let me let me uh, just let me finish by I'd like to read this last paragraph um, and then, um, you know, anybody who wants to stick around and make some comments, that's great. And the church did meet together oft to fast and to pray and to speak one with another concerning the welfare of their souls. And they did meet together oft to partake of the bread and wine in remembrance of the Lord Jesus. And they were strict to observe that there were that there should be no inequity among them, like Johnny said. And what's fascinating here is that he adds emphasis that they were strict to observe that there was no inequity, which inequality, uh, I think Johnny's comments about, uh, you know, in order to do that, you're, and I'm using air quotes, um, you know, great ones, your priests and teachers and elders, um, being the first one to uh, confess sins. It, wouldn't that be like, uh, talk about the novel thing. I And I, I don't mean to, it's just, I don't mean to like throw things at the LDS church. It's just, it, it's a, it's an easy example or an easy contrast um, where we can uh, identify, you know, learn from our mistakes. But in order to become a general authority, they sign a non-disclosure. And in that non-disclosure, you are not allowed to talk about past sins. So in essence, in the LDS church, you will never have an Alma the Younger. You will never have an Aaron Omner Hymni um, because you're not allowed to talk about that. And, and you, you know, you're, you're, there's a, you know, their computer system that keeps tabs on those things, but, uh, they were strict to observe that there should be no inequity among them. Um, and who's who was found to make, commit inequity a and three witnesses of the church iniquity, excuse me, and three witnesses of the church to condemn them before the elders and if they repented not and confessed not, their names were blotted out and they were not numbered among the people of Christ. But as oft as they repented and sought forgiveness with real intent, they were forgiven. So Johnny, again, and I can go there if you guys want, but what was the, what did you say the definition of uh, iniquity was uh, in the, Uh, Denver just uh, kind of, uh, not kind of, he equates iniquity to inequity. So, okay. you know, we're told that Zion is equal or flat. And um, so how do you get a people who clearly there's going to be people who know more than others? I mean, am I going to walk in there and say, I'm equal to a Denver snuffer or or I'm equal to any of you um, who are perhaps, you know, greater in knowledge and understanding than, than, than I am. That's not the equality. We each bring with us what we have. Um, Joseph said, you know, whatever knowledge a man attains in this life will rise with him. Well, whatever we have with us is going to be taken into Zion as well. And you can't just say, well, suddenly we're somehow equal and I know everything you know, that's not the case and never will be. So how do we have equity then? Well, what if it's through this doctrine of Christ? What if it's that even the high and mighty, the learned, the wise among us, humble and abase themselves in front of the people and say, watch, watch how fallen and off I am and watch me repent in front of you all. And watch me not stand on the side and say, hey, all you sinners, make sure you get baptized today. Rather, they go, they're, they're leading the way down um, and, and, and petitioning God in the humility of their hearts to, to, um, 
to redeem them, right? To, to bring them back into alignment with the will and atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, if, if that's the equity we're talking about, I think it's attainable. Like, I think I can do that with you all. And, and I hope you would be willing to do it with me. And, and and if you end up knowing more than me, then I'm okay with that because it's like, well, we're equal because we're both sinners and we're both seeking Christ. Um, so I'll, the rest of it doesn't matter, you know? I can let it all go, I guess. So Perfect. And, and just, sorry, I'm I'm going to... I think what Johnny's saying is really fascinating because it, it changes your concept of what we should be doing. And because in the LDS tradition, you know, we get courts, church courts where they throw you out and, um, you know, we come from that tradition where potentially that is, you know, what we're all thinking about. Well, if you sin, you know, a sin is you fill in the blank. And, you know, if you get three witnesses or in the case of the LDS church, 15 witnesses in a room that uh, they can throw you out. And, uh, you know, a number of us have been through that process. Um, but, uh, you know, if we're going to look at this other way, um, I wanted to highlight one thing right here. Um Inequity may not involve a direct commandment to violate. Um, Abraham didn't issue any commandments we have record of, but he was called of God and blessed. And therefore, everyone who worked at cross purposes, took his wife from him, as uh, happened on two occasions, was committing inequ inequity. So if we, if we, and without going through this, I'd, I'd recommend reading this whole thing. If we were to say, you know, inequity, iniquity is working at cross purposes with the Lord, that gives a much clearer and broader definition of this. Um, it almost goes, it, you know, that definition to me makes me think of uh, teach them correct principles and let them govern themselves type of thing. It's broader. It's 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 a higher it's a higher level. So if you replace that here, and it said they were strict to observe that there was no one who had cross purposes with the Lord among them, and whosoever was found to have cross purposes with the Lord, and three witnesses of the church identified that person or or witnessed that that person was going against the Lord or had cross purposes with the Lord. And if they repented not and confessed not, their names were blotted out and were not monger, numbered among the people of Christ. So when I was, uh, you know, again, we've been, we many of us have been through the disciplinary process of the church because we're not uh, um, in line with the powers that be. But if, if this is the process, um then uh um it looks like are you guys hearing me my my go to meeting says that there's some audio issues do you hear me hello do you hear me yeah okay just just to finish up um you know we're supposed me. to be the goal is that we're we're all on the same page we're one heart, one mind, and we're we're our goal is to to um, be in this Lord. But uh, any other thoughts before we finish? You know what? You just pay for this yourself now, you sucker. I'm ready. All right. Any Hi, other Mom. thoughts, everyone? Hi, Mom. All right, let me just finish this up and then we'll finish. But as often as they repented and sought forgiveness with real intent, they were forgiven and their meetings were conducted by the church after the manner of the workings of the Spirit and by the power of the Holy Ghost. For as the power of the Holy Ghost led them, whether to preach or exhort or to pray or to supplicate or to sing, even so it was done. Okay. Um, 
I'm I'm done with everything that I wanted to to share. Any any thoughts before we finish? I know that we're way over time at this point. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Next week we're going to do chapter seven and eight, and then uh, um, uh, the week after that. Uh, there's a lecture Denver's doing, so I think we'll be punting to the next week, and then we'll finish up the Book of Mormon with 9 and 10. So uh, um, hope everybody has a wonderful week. Thanks, Bryce. Thanks, Bryce. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye. Take care.